affected in such a way that it's not healthy. We come to that place where we become condemned, self-condemned in our own hearts. We find it very easy, especially in our historical Baptist tradition, to put ourselves in such a place of depravity and unworthiness that we often find that our view of grace is non-biblical. Which then the yo-yo slingshot re retraction of that, the, rever the reverberation of the, of the reciprocity of such thinking, sometimes is even, I don't know, heresy as we see so many coming to a hyper grace. But friends, the reality is this. We look at the lives of the Thessalonians and we see one of three things in relation to our own lives. We see a people that we could never be like. There's no way that we could be like these people. They lived in a time, we would say, that, that just doesn't exist anymore. To which Paul says, baloney. He says to the church of the Thessalonians in God, therefore in the same vein to the church of Claxton, to the church of Statesboro, to the church of Metter, to the church, to the church, to the church of Jesus Christ in these days, in these places. Friends, you are no more or no less equipped to live for Christ this day than the Thessalonians were that day. And just because they were known collectively for their Faith for the power of God collectively does not mean that there were individual circumstances that arose among them where these people failed and doubted and struggled. They struggled. They struggled to believe the gospel in certain aspects of the truth and the sufficiency of their salvation. They struggled to realize every day when they went to bed that they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And they still, even though they had a good gospel, they lived a good gospel, they lived as the church in power, they still frustrated themselves with the reality that there must be something more. We must do something more. We must be something more. And friends, as Paul continues in this introduction of this letter, he gives the clear pure, powerful reality that it is by the grace of God that this church exists. It is by the grace of God that you, beloved, sit here this day born of Him. And nothing that you do will sufficiently satisfy God. Nothing that you say, nothing that you achieve, no goal that you have, none of these things will sufficiently place you justified before Him. It is about Christ and Christ and Christ. No other work, no other person, no other name, and no other power. And we consider that it ought to bring us joy. And when we think about what Peter wrote to, to those Jews that were suffering at the sword, when he says you have a joy that is inexpressible, well, how do we have a joy that is inexpressible? Friends, because when I consider who I really am and then how God has saved me and the power of Christ that rests and compels me, I am awestruck with silence. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to sing. I have nothing to think except why? Why me, God? Why this day did you place your spirit in me? Why did you bring your word to me in power? Why did you bring your spirit in me and save me through Christ? Why did Christ go to the cross with me on his mind? Why was I the object of your affection? Why, Lord, when there are many more worthy? To which the word of God says there are none worthy. Not one. No, not one righteous. That our mouths are like open graves. Our tongues are like the tongues of asps. But yet, God in His wisdom has given us salvation in Jesus Christ. 
And one way of looking at these people of Thessalonica is we think we can never be like that. But we can and we are, beloved. Living in grace powerfully that we might be the people that reflect the nature of God, which is what we'll see this morning. Another thing that some people look at when they see this, some of us may have looked at this and thought, yeah, that's me. I'm living like the Thessalonians. Yeah, I got it together. My life is a reflection of the beauty of Christ. Everything's great. Thank God I'm holy. To which I would say, be careful. It's a very bad proposition. It's a very bad stand to take before Christ. For as Jesus told the story of a Pharisee and a publican, He told the story that the Pharisee stood out in public and beat his, or raised his arms and raised his head high and said, Thank you, God. I am the way I am. But yet the publican, shamed, hidden from view, bowed his head, never to even dare look at the heavens, tore his clothes and beat upon his chest and said, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, This man went home justified. That man went home condemned. So let us not think for a moment that we have lived this last week nor this last day without some fleshly displeasure to the Lord. But yet we who are in Christ, though we may live and at an occasion <laughs> willfully rebel against Him, this life that we live because we belong to Christ is not a stench to the nose of our Father, but is a fragrant offering. We live in the power of the economy of God's grace, and we live in such a way that God is always well pleased with the work of His Son in us. And beloved, Christ. Remember Philippians? See, that's the bad thing about the introductions to these letters because they're so strong and powerful and they get us just, they plow us deep within the soil of, of truth and then we just sort of sprout and we forget the foundation of our organic birth, of our supernatural birth. Just like the Philippians. When Paul wrote to the Philippians and, and he says to them, He who began a good work in you is faithful to see it to completion. What does that mean? That means that when our, when our hearts are shaken by sin, when our lives are dis just disarrayed because of our flesh, that we stand completed in Christ and one day He will finish that which He began. And that when we strive to walk in Him, that's a good Effort, it's a good desire, but those efforts and those desires do not produce the walking that Christ requires. But Christ Himself produces that which is true. Friends, you will not be given up on. You will not fail in your faith if you belong to God. You will not allow sin to take you by the throat, though it may seem that way this present day. God will restore you. God will bring you to completion. God will bring you to eternal life. And there may be seasons where you look just like a Thessalonian. And there may be seasons where you look just like a 1 Corinthian. <laughs> and friends, there may be days, if you're like me, that you look in the mirror and you, don't, you see both. And then if you really look deep into, that, into your eyes, you see yourself as a Galatian. I've been adding to the gospel. But we should look in the mirror, seeing our insufficiency, and then look in the mirror of our soul through the Word of God and see Christ's sufficiency. Look at the letter. I'll just start in verse 1, go through verse 8. Paul, Silvanus, we know his name is Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, 
but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and imitators of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Think of that for a moment. Specifically, we've gone through these first three verses. We've seen that God brings peace and grace through Jesus Christ, that we are sealed in Christ. We are the beloved, the church, the ecclesia, the called out, the anointed, the set apart. And that the result of that in the life of the apostles, the result of that in the life of the church, friends, is that we have an affection that is the, all the affection of Christ. Listen, many people ponder, what's the application of preaching? Well, friends, if I have to give you a point with an underline, you're not listening. The point and the underline is there. Paul says, we give thanks to God always. Therefore, in the same vein, with the same spirit, with the same power, when we see the life of Christ and those around us, we give thanks to God always. We remember each other in our prayers. Do we have to spell it out in such a way that the Christian who is saved by the grace of God and has received the peace of God, who was called out by God, prays for each other. Fill in the blank. Prays for each other. No, we don't have to do that. We live in a day and age where our brains are idle 90% of the time. We walk around in an, emotional, in an emotional fog. We walk around in an intellectual decay. We don't think, we don't process what we see, we don't process what we hear. We walk around considering when we're going to check the next social media, when we're going to look at our phone, when we're going to see the next show, when we're going to escape the next reality. We're going to live vicariously through things, through entertainment, through education, through everything. Friends, the power of God comes only through the meditation of the Word of God. There is no other power under the sun of this cosmos. There is no other anointing to receive except that we eat the Word of God who is Jesus Christ, the Word that became flesh, and then we meditate on Him day and night so that we are successful in all that we do. We want prosperity in the context of our spiritual lives, but yet we do not do that which is necessary for us to feed and grow and be prosperous in those things. We give more time to our jobs, to our children, to our houses, to our, to our banks. We give more time to, our, to what people think of us in the community. We give more time preparing for tomorrow than we do living today in the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Friends, if you have a job, you are there to shine brightly to the point that people are blinded and, 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 and hate you or their eyes are open and they love the Christ that reigns within you. You raise your children so that as they see you sin, they see you repent, they see you bow before the Lord, they see you work through your differences at home, they see you do what is right by them in discipline, they see you not love the world, don't give them everything, don't share with them everything, don't show them that the world is theirs and they can take it by storm. Friends, the world belongs to the devil and he and everything in the world that is not of Christ will suffer the judgment equally under the wrath of the fury of God and God will destroy all things that are not for him and not in him and hit the torment of their destruction will go up forever. Jesus said it very clearly, what good it does it a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul. And sadly, I believe that sometimes our ministry and our faith is in the world. The Word of God is alive and it works in us or we are dead to it. And Paul says, I prayed for you. Why do you pray for him? <laughs> because God had to do the work or they would not get done. God had to seal them and secure them in their faith or they wouldn't have no security. 
And there is no teacher, there is no school, there is no denomination, there is no, there is no pastor, there is no group of Christians, there's no program, there's no book, there's no conference, there's nothing that can give you that. You know what a conference does? It gets you good there. And you come home and you fizzle out. Oh, I wish I could feel that again. I've never been to a conference that gave me the great joy that the Word of God gives me. I could be more alive in the trunk of my car with this Bible than I could be in the middle of 50,000 people singing Horatio Spafford's It Is Well. Now it's moving. But you know what? When I hear the, when I hear the initial chord of a Mozart piece live, I cry. It just overwhelms me. I'm like, that's beautiful. That's not God. That that I feel is not truth. It's that that I know that is truth. The one that I know. That which was from the beginning. That which we have seen and touched and heard. And we now proclaim to you the eternal life that was manifest to you that we now proclaim that you may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And these things, what does John say many times, are written that your joy may be full. We need to think, church. We need to hear. We need to pause for a moment. We need to go back to the day when a letter meant something. I remember the first time I got a letter in many years, I thought, this is weird. This guy's a crazy. Why, why would he do this? Most of the time when somebody sends you a letter, it's hate mail. You know. Why would they write letters? Friends, that's what God has done. God has purposed to write to us. I don't know who said it. Somebody in this fellowship posted it some weeks ago. It's amazing how when we leave the house and our phones are left on the table, we'll break our neck and nearly have a wreck to go back and get our phones. But yet our Bible can sit idle all week. It's a disconcerting reality when I see men called of Christ to preach the gospel who do not carry a Bible. They don't have one accessible. And yet, dogs them out. I, I ordered me a waterproof Bible a couple of weeks ago, and it's too heavy to carry. <laughs> it weighs like six pounds. And it's ugly. It's got clouds on it. <laughs> but how, do you have the Word of God close? I know we've got digital media now. We can pull it up all the time. But I'll be honest with you. I've never seen anybody that just, out of habit, picks up their phone to check the Bible. If I pick up the phone, I'm going to see who's called. Or if I'm going to check the Bible and I see people have called. Oh, I've missed. Oh, great. What's going on? Oh, cool. Oh, I wonder what they said on Facebook. Oh, there's an email too. I do need a new pair of shoes. Speaking of shoes, I forgot to clean those off the porch. Oh, I need to go blow the porch off. You see how that works? We're never going to get around to Jesus. The Word of God here has done its full work in the lives of these Christians. Look at verse 4. He says, we, we remember you, we thank God for all these things, for these three things, for the, for the labor of love, the work of faith, the steadfastness of hope in Christ. Verse 4, for we know. And I thought about just preaching that this morning. For we know. Now, if I say without a shadow of a doubt that I know something, I know, and I'm usually right. You know, aren't y'all? Aren't we usually right? You're always, yeah, Pam is always right. Come on Tuesday night sometimes. She's, she got it. We know what we know, but if I say I know unequivocally, without doubt, no problem, that doesn't always mean it's true. Because I am not speaking under the authority of inerrancy by the Spirit of God in everything I say. I do when I read Paul. When I read God's Word to you, it is inerrant. When I talk about it, problems could come. That's why we go back to the Word 
in its context to see if that which I just commentated matched the play. <laughs> But Paul then says, for we know. So that means that by the power of God, that as Paul wrote, God spoke. God is saying Paul knows with an absolute certainty what he's about to say. Do you understand that? That's why the Word of God is the source of our power. That's why the Word of God is the, is the, is the vehicle for grace. That's why we must be in the Word. That's why the church must eat and breathe and live the Bible. Because it is only through the Scriptures we can know anything. Jesus says in John 17, This is eternal life, that you know the one true God and the Son whom He has sent. Do you know? Because if the knowledge of God that we have, the, the intimacy with this Jesus that we know is not, the not, is not the one that's given to us through Scripture, it's not the true God. It's not the true Jesus. It's not the true faith. It's not the true good news. It's not good news at all, but it's cut off. It's anathemos. It's not truth. For we know, what is it that we know? Brothers loved by God. You see that parenthetical? You see that little pause there? For we know brothers loved by God. That's what he's calling the Christians. Now don't take that wrongly. Don't believe, don't believe Paul being misogynist. He's not. Brethren is the collective nature of the siblings of Christ. It's what we call ourselves. It's what they used. For we know, brothers, in Christ, grace and peace have been given to you in the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. You are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We know you are our brothers. And because our brothers, we know that you are loved by God. I want you to see that. See, it's not just a passing thought. It's not just a passing, it's not just a passing expression, an identifier of the audience. It's a theological firmness. Brothers, loved by God, we know that He has chosen you. That's the knowledge. And people get all weirded out right here. But friends, this is some of the strongest most beautiful, most passionate, most powerful realities of God that you will ever understand in your life. We know that He has chosen you. How can you be so sure? Doesn't the world always question our salvation? Don't we question each other's? Don't we question our own? It's not a bad thing to put it into question. But I guess the answer to how we know that we know that we know. You've never heard that, have you? <laughs> if you haven't, Lord bless you, because that's good. But I grew up hearing that. Do you want to know? Listen. Do you want to know? I mean, you know. Do you want to know that you know that you know? You ever tried to diagram how that works on paper? You don't have to know that you know that you know. You can know that Christ, God, has chosen you. Paul says to the Romans that the Spirit of God testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. The Scripture teaches that we are the beloved in Christ. So how did these Thessalonians know that they were chosen? How did Paul know that they were chosen? Let me tell you something. If you go to 1 Corinthians and you see the problem that Chloe tattled, she, she snitched on these people. The elders lied to Paul and said, all is good. Chloe's like, all right, letting them get away with that. Chloe wrote to Paul and said, they're lying. We are eat up with sin. And so by the standard in which we live in our culture, this is what happens. This is how it would be done if 
we were to write a letter to the Corinthians today by the standard of our culture. Oh, you see all that sin down there in those people? They're not believers. We'd have written a letter. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ, apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the so-called church of God that is in Corinth. To those that say they're sanctified in Jesus Christ. Called to be saints, yeah, right, not. With all those in every place who say they've called upon the name of the Lord. You see how that sounds? Paul doesn't say that to the Corinthians. Paul is sure of their election. Paul is sure that God has chosen them. He says, to the church of God that is in Corinth. Now, was everyone who claimed to be the church in the church? No! Were some of the people who were sinning in that church not the church? That's right. But were some people who were caught up in that sin the church? Yes, they were. That's why he corrects it. He didn't say throw people out who live this way. He says correct them and then if they don't correct, throw them out. Throw them out of your lives, not out of the worship service. There was no such thing. Throw them out of your life if you live wrongly and don't stop. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that God has chosen you, brothers. You can say the same thing to Corinth. You know what that teaches us? That we have security in our salvation even when we see sin in our lives because our hope is not in repenting of sin but in the person of Jesus Christ. If our security is in the walking of holiness, friends, we are doomed. If our security, because our standard of holiness is so far off the mark, even as Christians, even as the saints of God, our standard of what living an upright life looks like in righteousness is wrong. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm following this. I'm living this way. I'm believing this way. I'm thinking this way. I'm putting to death my flesh. But you're still mired in flesh. The difference is, as believers, we are no longer bound to the flesh. We're no longer controlled by the flesh. We can put it to death. But even our view of holiness is not pure. It is not full. Because we cannot in our infinite, in our infinite minds, I mean in our finite minds, understand and see the infinite reality of holiness. We can't grasp it. It's not about us walking, but yet God produces a walking, and that's what Paul's about to show. Paul says, you are chosen by God. So the gratitude of Paul and the apostles was that he saw their labor of love, their labor of work, and the work of faith, the labor that they had, and their love for one another. And he says, then I see your spiritual fruit. Verse 4, we know that God has chosen you. Five, because... Our gospel came to you not only in word. We didn't just preach it, but it came in power in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So let's unpack that for a minute. Let's unpack this for a minute. That this, this made the disciples, the apostles, thankful to God because God produced a spiritual fruit in them. Thank you, God, that they have love. Thank you, God, they have faith. Thank you, God, that they are known for the glory of your work and your grace and your gospel. Thank you, God, you've produced a fruitfulness in them. So if we as Grace Truth are not known for the fruitfulness of the gospel, what are we known for? Right teaching? Who cares? It's important, but if it doesn't produce the fruit of faith, what good is it? There's a certainty of your election. There's a certainty of your salvation. Paul says, I have a knowledge, a sure apostolic authoritative knowledge that you are elect. You are the church. You are the saints. You have been chosen 
by God. Why? Because we came and preached to you in language, but it did not just stop with you hearing us talk. There was power involved in the hearing of this gospel. And when you see the word spirit and in power, friends, they're synonymous. <laughs> that which is in the spirit is powerful. That which is powerful is, is so because of the spirit. Is the Word of God powerful in you? Is the Spirit of God at work in you? He cannot be except that the Word of God be richly and continually invited into you through your eyes and through your ears and through your mind. Well, that seems like we're limiting God. No, that is God in His wisdom. That's how He chose to be powerful. God no longer speaks apart from His Word because He doesn't need to. He only speaks through this. So this gratefulness, this election came because of the Word. This election came because of the power of God through the Spirit. And so in the Spirit, as Paul would say there, because our gospel came to you not only were but in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction in this Holy Spirit. This is Paul saying we know that you are indeed the elect of God. You are indeed the church because the Spirit of God in you is proof of your election. The Spirit of God in you is proof of your salvation. The Spirit of God in you shows that God is in you. For you, beloved Thessalonians, who were left and abandoned under the, under, under the persecution of me and Silas, we left you and you are infants. You know not what even you speak of, but you know Christ and Him crucified. And the power of the Spirit of God has transformed you even without being discipled, even without growing in your knowledge of the truth. You are growing in, your, in the reality of that truth because God has worked in you. Therefore, I know your election is true. I know that you are chosen by God. I know that grace and peace has come to you through Jesus Christ because you exemplify as witnesses and testimony of the power of God and nobody can say I taught them to do that you see that we can follow the rules we can look Christian but friends the Thessalonians didn't know how but they did because the Spirit of God is proof how are we sealed in our faith how are we sealed for the day of redemption by the Spirit he comes he he takes us. He submerges us in Him and He never leaves. God, the Holy Spirit, indwells His people. And He produces all that is required. The power of the gospel in the life of the true church changes her, molds her, makes her, secures her. What about this conviction? What does it mean? You know what a conviction is? A conviction is a certainty. When someone is accused of a crime and the evidence shows they did it and they are convicted, that means with certainty he did it. So in the same way, conviction inside of our hearts and minds proves that we are in Christ because our belief produces an outward expression. Our belief, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 4, I believe, therefore I spoke. You know why I preach the gospel? Because I believe it. My trust is in Christ, so I preach Christ and Him crucified. This was true of the Thessalonians. They were certainly Christ's because all they talked about was Christ. I hear... I've heard through my life, time and time again, talking with individuals in an attempt to make themselves feel better about their weakness and their lack of passion for the gospel. Well, we can't just talk about Jesus all the time. Yes, we can. You give me, you give me one topic that is more exhilarating, more vigorating, more glorious than the gospel of Jesus. And we'll stop right now and we'll go to that. 
And sadly, beloved, many people think politics and athletics and everything else is more glorious than Christ. There's nothing else. Everything else in comparison is boring. With full conviction, the belief of these Christians produced an, produced an absolute resolve that nothing would shake them. They were convicted to the core. They had a conviction of mind and soul and spirit that they were going to live for Christ. They didn't care what it cost them. They wanted nothing more than to walk and preach and live the gospel. And that's what they did. Election is the power and work of God through the Spirit. This choosing, these are one and the same. And something you need to remember about election. It's a scary word. It's a word that we don't use in our vernacular because it causes us to have to put aside the power of our own glory. It causes us to have to put aside the, the working of our own flesh and the choices of our own will. Let me tell you what our will is. It is bound by the flesh. It is free completely to choose that which it is bound to. I cannot change a thing about what I am, who I am, period. I can't transform myself into a giraffe, change the color of my skin, Decide I want to be green-eyed. It doesn't work. No matter how free I am to decide those things, the choices in those areas are bound by my physical makeup, by how God has created me. And when it comes to spiritual things, my will is bound by that which I am corrupted. No one seeks after God. No, not one. But God in His mercy, while we were dead in our sins and trespasses against Him, made us alive in Christ. Friends, God has chosen us and this election is eternal. And Ephesians 1.4 says, Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. This election is not just eternal. This election is evident as we see right there in verse 4. Verse 4 that we know it's evident. Election is evident. And finally, election, there's not complete, but just three things to think about. Election is effectual. In Romans, Romans 11, 7, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. In Titus 1.1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. Paul would say to the Corinthians that as grace extends to more and more, it produces thanksgiving to God. Listen, friends. God's Word does that which it was intended to do. And when God's Word goes out, if you see someone come to faith, it is because that is what God intended for it to happen. When you see someone not believe, it is that which God intended to happen. Paul is saying to them, don't be deceived by what people would tell you. Don't be deceived by what people would share with you. Don't be deceived to think that your salvation is not secure in the gospel of Christ because your life and your preaching, your testimony shows God's Spirit is in you and the power of God rests upon you. And you know our life showed that, he says. Look at it. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. We proved that we were indeed the elect. We proved that we were the brothers of Christ because we came to you in power. We came to you living a life according to the work of God within us and therefore we now see it in you. Not only did you see it among us, but in verse 6, you imitated us. You're doing what we do. You're living as we live. And we're not even there to show you. And you receive the Word of God, not easy. Look at this. This is a great point. We're almost done. 
You did not receive the Word of God sitting with your hands folded, your legs crossed, the air condition blowing, everything was good. Oh yeah, this is, this is true. You received the Word in much affliction. You know what that looks like? You know one thing that you can tell someone truly is hungry for Christ is that they come, flood or famine, to see the body of Christ worship together and to hear the Word. 4.30 on my clock, I saw this morning before I went to sleep. It's good. Now I'll sleep probably 6 o'clock on until in the morning. It's more important to be in the Word together with the saints than to sleep. It's more important to eat the Word of God together than to eat. Well, I'm so hungry. Are you? When I'm working on a project with my hammer, I forget to eat. Because I want to see it come together. I want to see the paint go up. I want to see the project finished. If I'm programming a radio, or if I'm doing... Man, I feel like I'm about to faint when you stand up. Oh, I haven't eaten in 17 hours. I better go eat. And those boring, benign, wasteful, temporary things can cause us to skip food. Why not the Word and the fellowship of the saints? It's about power. It's about the Spirit. It's about the truth within us. It's about the conviction of our souls. You receive the Word in much affliction. It wasn't easy for you. We came preaching after being imprisoned. And now we're coming here and they're trying to lock us up too. And they're coming after you now because you believed in Christ as we preached Him. You received the Word in much affliction, but in that affliction you had great joy, which was yours in the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, thank you so. God bless you so. Lord Jesus, you are so real with us. We believe this word that you've brought through these apostles, though we've had to send them on their way to protect their lives. Oh, Lord, here comes the posse. Here comes the judge. Here comes the sword. Hallelujah. You received it with much affliction and with much joy in the Spirit. Paul says we see these things. Your lives are genuine. Friends, there are people who will not come fellowship under the Word of God because the air doesn't work or the heat doesn't work or the, or the fact that there's not enough seats or the fact that there, it's just weird because you're in a gas station or there's nothing for my children. There's everything for our children. The Word of God alone will save your children. Anything else we give your children to give them an appeasement of their faith will send them to hell. And when they're 40 and they're 50, they will look back on the things that they do and they will satisfy their souls in a, in a worldly famine. Children, if you do not believe the gospel of Jesus, if you do not hear the Word of God, you will perish in your sin. With much affliction. Brothers and sisters across this world are dragging their infant children to an illegal location to hear this same type of preaching. Knowing that if they're called their very children will be beheaded before them on the street and they take them. God have mercy on our easy believism in America. There are more Christians in third world nations than there will ever be in the United States of America. Friends, there are less than one half of a percent of our population who are born of God. And that's by their confession in the last 20 years of polls. Their hope is not in Christ. They're religious. They're churchy. They're not the saints of God. You proclaim Christ as we did. You imitated us in preaching. You imitated us in living. You imitated us in wisdom. You imitated us in power. 
And your joy was full even though everything that you experienced was pain. Therefore, verse 7, look at that. You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. You want to impact the world? You want to change the culture? You want to transform your family? You want to see your kids grow up? And love Christ or at least know Him? Then we've got to live as an example. And that example is not some contrived, low-minded, worldly Christianity. That example is a white hot, blinding devotion to Christ with joy and suffering. Because it's going to cost you when you stand for truth. Not only has the Word of the Lord sounded from you, not only have you preached it, not only have you proclaimed it, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere that you need not say anything. What's that look like? It's like Paul would say to the church at Colossae, I pray that I may fill up what is lacking in the suffering of Christ in my body for your sake. It's easy to love Jesus when life's a bed of roses. Take your health. Take your family. Take your freedom. Take your prosperity. Take your influence. Take your peers. Take the esteem that's given to you by your job and by your place in society away and then stand in joy and preach Jesus like a fool. That's how they were witnesses. And friends, that's the only example that matters in this life. It's the only one. Having Christian literature on the table, doesn't matter. Having Scripture on your wall, doesn't matter. Having a bumper sticker that says, I love Jesus, doesn't matter. What matters is, is that we live as an example as we pursue Christ, which will cause suffering, and we are joyful in it. And we resolve to maintain that because of our full conviction. So, beloved, will you be a witness? Are you a witness? The only way we will be a witness is if we together continually grow in the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, bring true and powerfully this text in our lives. Give us a sense of all and a peace that surpasses all understanding as we look to be the body in power. Help us to pray for each other. Help us to teach each other. Help us to stop, stop convicting each other of reprobation when we are the beloved of Christ. Help us to be certain of our salvation and drive us to the center of the cross, the center of the gospel, the center of Jesus Christ. Drive us there in our passions through Your Word and keep us there by Your Spirit. Help us to look after one another. Help us to encourage each other. Help us to pray for each other. And help us to let go of the idols of our world's religion and trust fully in the, the simplicity and the power of Jesus Christ, who is the living Word. In His name we pray. Amen.